Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Maria Parham, editorial page editor for the Arizona Daily Star. In tonight's AZ Illustrated Metro, we'll explore several cases the U.S. Supreme Court heard this session. They include cases about voting rights, affirmative action, and same-sex marriage. We'll talk to several people about the local impact of the justices' decisions. We'll also find out why historians are concerned about the future of a Southern Arizona historic property. But first, a look at today's top stories. Today's U.S. Supreme Court ruling involving affirmative action in university admissions does not have much of an effect on the University of Arizona, ASU, or NAU. In 2011, Arizona voters passed a constitutional amendment banning race as a factor for university admissions and other state functions. Following the passage of that amendment, the University of Arizona put information on its website explaining that while no longer would race be used as a factor in admissions, the university would still strive for a racially diverse student body. Meanwhile, researchers at the U of A also put together studies on racial diversity on university campuses. Those studies were given to the justices on the Supreme Court for this case. Coming up, we'll have an interview with one of those researchers. An annual report ranking child well-being finds Arizona ranking near the bottom. The Kids Count report produced by the Annie E. Casey Foundation ranks Arizona 47th in the nation when it comes to children's well-being. That's a drop of a point from last year. According to the data used for the ranking, two out of three Arizona children do not attend preschool and close to 30 percent live in poverty. In Pima County, only 27% of children live in a home where all the parents are employed, and 24% of children in the county live below the poverty line. The numbers are based on census data from 2011. And the immigration reform bill sponsored by the Gang of Eight passed a crucial test in the U.S. Senate this afternoon. An amendment adding more Border Patrol agents was approved. That vote was seen as crucial for building momentum for the passage of the entire package potentially later this week. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Today, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in an affirmative action case regarding university admissions policies in Texas. They sent the case back to a lower court. Joining me to discuss that case and today's decision is Jeffrey Milam, UA Professor of Educational Policy Studies and Practice. Jeff, thanks so much for being here to discuss this case. Could you start out by summarizing what the case was that went before the court? Sure. In this case, a, a, a woman by the name of Abigail Fisher had sued the University of Texas, arguing that its use of race as one of many factors in its college admissions practices was unconstitutional. What the court found, however, in this case, essentially, was that they ruled that the, that the principles of using race as one of many factors in admissions, as outlined in the University of Michigan lawsuits around affirmative action, or the Grutter case, as many have called it, uh, in fact, were legal, that, that there was a compelling interest in diversity and that Texas uh, had that right. But what they did, what they ruled, however, in this case was is that, that the case was not, or the court had not determined in that the University of Texas's use of race was narrowly tailored enough in, in legal arguments. Essentially, that, te that the court had not established that the use of race could, or the benefits of diversity could not be achieved through a race neutral alternative. Okay, so could you, your research was very important in this case. Could you tell us about that and just which justices uh, had considered part of your research in their uh, making their decisions? Sure, actually, I'm a group of, a, of social scientists and educators from around the country who've been actively involved in this work for quite a long time. Originally, our work informed the decision in the Grutter case. But essentially what we've established through our social science evidence, through educational research, is that there are benefits to educationally diverse learning environments that don't exist in more racially homogeneous learning environments. And that in order to achieve these benefits, that certain sorts of conditions need to be in place. In this instance in Texas, you have to have a, 
a, a diverse student body and a diverse student body that actually extends into the classroom level in order for these benefits to accrue. So that's the work that we've, that we've done in terms of helping to establish the argument from the perspective of Texas that they have a right to use race as one of many factors. Now, um, Justice Thomas in his dissenting concurrence wrote today, and I'm gonna read this, blacks and Hispanics admitted to the University of Texas as a result of racial discrimination are on average far less prepared than their white and Asian classmates. And he sat, cited lower SAT and ATC scores. Um, how does your research jive with that? And what's your reaction to that statement? Well, in, in Justice Thomas's opinion, he's actually arguing for the overturn of Grutter and consequently then the overturn of, overturn of Bakke, which is the case that preceded Grutter. Okay, define those for us again a little bit. Sure, Bakke was a case that looked at the essentially the, in the late 1970s that first established the idea that diversity was a compelling government and educational interest for institutions. It was Justice Powell's case in the Bakke decision that established that. That's the case law on which Grutter or the Michigan Affirmative Action cases was based. And in that opinion, Justice O'Connor upheld Justice Powell's opinion and said that diversity was a compelling interest uh, and could be used as one of many factors in college admissions. Not a predominant factor, or a dominant factor, but one of many factors. What Justice Thomas is arguing essentially here is, is that ACT scores and SAT scores should be the only predictors of success in college. And in fact, places like Texas, places like the U of A use a variety of indicators to determine success in admission. Can you explain to us what some of those are? Yeah, we look at sort of at transcripts and the types of courses that students take. We look at the extent to which they've been engaged in co-curricular activities. We look at other sorts of special skills and attributes that they have that could add to their success at the institution or could add to the diversity of the student body in an institution to help provide diverse skills, diverse perspectives, et cetera. So in your experience, are the University of Texas policies common? Among public, among highly selective public universities in the U.S. and among selective private institutions, yes, most of those institutions use race as one of many factors in their admissions processes. And um, how could it, this affect um, the U of A? Then they're already doing some of this. Can you explain to us just what goes on here? Well, at universities across the country, what I would say is is that what there's nothing in this case that would suggest that they need to do anything differently than they're doing, except to establish through social science evidence, like the kind of work that my colleagues and I do, that they achieve the benefits that they say that they want to achieve with diversity, and that they can't be achieved with any race-neutral alternative. The University of Arizona is in a state, through the passage of Prop 107, where it's against the law for the university to use race as a factor in admissions. But the university still uses a wide variety of factors, many like the ones that I indicated to you a couple of minutes ago, in making decisions about admission to the University of Arizona, both in undergraduate, graduate, and professional programs. Is this is it, it, or um, do you think it will go back to court yet again? I, well, I'm, clearly it's going to go back to court again because the Supreme Court has sent it back to the Court of Appeals, which is likely then to remand it back to the District of Court, where at that point in time, a trial is going to need to occur. And the, and the, the questions raised by the Supreme Court are going to have to be answered regard, regarding narrow tailoring. Jeff, thank you so much for being here today. The Mountain View Black Officers Club at Fort Huachuca in Sierra Vista is part of a small number of historic buildings receiving a new distinction this month. The Officers Club is among the most threatened historic buildings in the country. That's according to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. The building is not on the National Historic Registry, but it has historic status with the state. As Andrea Kelly reports, preservationists hope the new designation as a threatened piece of American history can help restore the Mountain View Black Officers Club. To some people, this building, called the Mountain View Officers Club, is nothing more than an old splintered building that has no relevance in our modern day society. But as for me, it is one that is an integral part of the United States Army 
and the history of the United States of America. Mountain View Black Officers Club was built in 1942 and remains one of the most significant examples of World War II era military service clubs in the United States. The military, in response to a separate but equal laws of the early 20th century, began a large scale effort at Fort Huachuca Army Base to build barracks, hospitals, maintenance structures, offices, warehouses, and recreational facilities, all of which were segregated and in many cases built in duplicate. Considering the fact that the other buildings that were built right along with the Mountain View Office Club. Consider that, considering that all these buildings were built around the same time, the Mountain View Office Club does not bear the distinction of being a historic facility. And what I say is, if this is true, and if the Mountain View Office Club meets the historic facilities standard, then why is it that it is viewed differently. Mountain View is the most significant example of a military service club in the United States, but built specifically for African American officers. The Mountain View Black Officers Club historic significance has been well documented by local and national historians and preservationists. For a decade, our organization advocated the preservation of this unique resource. The local Buffalo soldiers, on their behalf, of building 66050. Our organization salutes you. When someone calls you a Buffalo soldier, hey, you get us straight back because it's a reference to you, the importance of being a ferocious fighter and that you have history. This bill here is part of our history. I too am a Buffalo soldier. Now the preservation of this structure, in my view, will acknowledge and serve as a reminder that even during the darkest days of our racial evolution in this country, blacks have remained loyal to the United States of America. Amen. And they have supported and defended the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, both foreign and domestic. From 2004 through 2011, we worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to begin the restoration of the building. After the hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations and volunteer time, our lease was not renewed, and now the face of the building hangs in the balance. Hopefully this is going to change it all. Mountain View is currently on what's called the active disposal list, and essentially what that means is that the that basically the building is slated for demolition. So right now its future is still in jeopardy. The club has been listed on our state historic registry and has been recommended for listing on the National Register of Historic Places by the Arizona State Historic Preservation Office and the Tucson Historic Preservation Foundation. Because the SWABS organization was barred from listing this property in the National Register of Historic Places, our organization took it upon ourselves to go ahead and prepare and submit a National Register nomination. About a year ago, this National Register nomination was reviewed by the State Historic Preservation Office and the Historic Sites Review Committee. Both of those organizations and that group unanimously agreed that this building is nationally significant and that should be forwarded to the keeper of the National Register of Historic Places. So at present, the property is only listed at the State Registry. The problem, of course, being that we are not the property owners of this property, so we are not allowed to submit this nomination to the keeper. The Army must submit the nomination to the keeper. As a nation, I believe that we should embrace our history and we should learn from it, not destroy it, not evade, or run from it. And we got to stop looking at it as the officer, the black officer club. We got to start looking at it as American history. Once you get the mindset changed, that it's American history as opposed to black history, attitude changes, purse open up, people listen. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring out that mindset from 1942 to 2013. <laughs> There's more information about the history of the Mountain View Black Officers Club on our website, azpm.org.
The Supreme Court decided against striking down affirmative action today, opting instead for a narrow ruling that sends the dispute back to a lower court for a second look. We get analysis from Marsha Coyle on that and other rulings today, plus a debate about what the high court's limited decision on affirmative action means for the future. Then, NSA leaker Edward Snowden remains on the run. From Hong Kong to Moscow to who knows where next, Margaret Warner looks at how the U.S. is trying to track him down. Ray Suarez has our coverage of opening statements in the trial of George Zimmerman, charged with second-degree murder in the shooting death of Florida teenager Trayvon Martin. And Judy Woodruff talks to two authors who are tracking the shift of power from Washington, D.C. to the cities and states launching a metropolitan revolution. That's all I had on tonight's News Hour. One of the Supreme Court's most anticipated decisions this year raises as many questions as it answers. The justices told a lower court to re-examine a case involving the University of Texas and affirmative action. We'll hear from NPR's Nina Totenberg on what the Supreme Court's ruling on affirmative action does and does not mean on the next morning edition from NPR News. The Supreme Court heard two voting rights cases this year. Joining me to discuss the implication of the court's decision regarding an Arizona law is Chris Rhodes, the voter registrar at the Pima County Recorder's Office. Chris, thanks so much for being here today. Could you start by explaining what the Arizona case was that was before the court? Certainly. The uh, voters in, in 2004 enacted Proposition 200, which put some restrictions on voting in Arizona. The first is you have to prove citizenship at the time you register to vote. Uh, what was at issue before the Supreme Court was that particular provision, and they were reviewing a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decision that said if the voter uses the National Voter Registration Form, which is can be used in all 50 states, um, does the federal law preempt the state law and, and say you do not have to prove your, your United States citizenship? Um, so it's fairly limited in, in the scope of what the, the ruling was. And the justices ruled on a 7-2 to two vote that indeed the federal form preempted state law um, and that, that people who use the national voter registration form do not have to prove United States citizenship when they register. If they use the state form, they still have to prove their United States citizenship. Did they give some reasons for ruling that way? Uh, this was pretty much a straight federal law preempts state law when it's mm -hmm. covering the same issue. Uh, what made this one interesting is this was not a law enacted by Congress. Congress said create a national voter registration form. The form itself was created by various agencies of the federal government and they simply would not put in the Arizona instruction within their provision that you had to prove citizenship. So the only thing missing here is the instructions saying um, that you have to prove citizenship. If they had put that in, then there would have been no issue at all for the court. Uh, what the court left open is the, the ability of Arizona to go back and ask that that provision be put into the instructions. And I believe the Secretary of State is planning on doing just that. So that is allowed then to go back and put it in. There was one other um, little loophole, as I recall, that if, the, if uh, someone had reason to believe the person was not a U.S. citizen, that they were also allowed to query on the state form. Is that correct? That's correct. We're, we're actually allowed to ask on the national form as well. And what occurs is when you register, we enter your form in a system, it speaks with the motor vehicle system. And a, a non-citizen can get a driver's license if they're here legally. Um, and the, the MVD computer system tracks that. And so it'll tell us when we enter the form and bounce it off of their system, it'll tell us this is not a citizen. And at that point, we're now allowed to ask them to prove their citizenship. Uh, motor vehicle tends to have a database that's a little out of date on citizenship, so we get a lot of false hits uh, in that manner. So let's move on to the other case. Um, it's about the Federal Voting Rights Act, and it involves Arizona as well. Can you explain that case to us? Certainly. Um, Section 5 of the National Voter Registration Act mandates that certain jurisdictions have to get permission to make any change at all uh, that impacts a voter in any way, shape, or form. And in asking for that permission, we have to prove that there, it will have no discriminatory impact um, directly or indirectly on any of the protected groups of people, whether they be Native Americans, minority languages, or race uh, minorities. 
Um, the Shelby County has challenged the constitutionality of it. And um, Shelby County is where? In Alabama. And that's where most of this is applied to, right? Correct. When Congress originally enacted the National Voter Registration Act, Section 5 was supposed to last for five years. This was back in 1965. And they targeted a formula and said, here's the places that have to comply with this. And it was based on the percentage of turnout of minority voters in 1964, 1968, or 1972 in those elections. When Congress extended the voter, uh, National Voter Registration Act Section 5 provision, they did it a few years ago, they did not update that to any more modern elections. As a result, the states across the South uh, were the ones predominantly impacted by it, along with Arizona and a few others, um, because of our turnout in 1968. Um, and the challenge here is you can't use a formula going back 30 years and say we're still discriminating 30 years later and that's exactly what Shelby County has raised as the issue is they if had they updated it um, to looking at more recent elections then they would have uh, none of us would be covered by that act. All right in the short time we have left tell us what the impact would be on Arizona if this law is upheld or not upheld. But again, we have a very little right. time here. If That's a big question. Certainly. If it's upheld, there'll be no changes. We continue complying with what we've been doing all along. If it's found invalid, then we don't have to ask for permission to make any changes. And some of the changes are a little... It, if I change one sentence in a letter, I have to ask Justice Department's permission and I have to prove it doesn't discriminate. That one sentence change. That will go away. So in some ways it would make your job easier that you could do some day-to-day -day things then? That's correct. It would make my job a lot easier. Okay. Chris, thanks so much for being here today. You're quite welcome. Thank you for having me. Another issue at the U.S. Supreme Court this year is same-sex marriage a case involving a California law banning the state from allowing same-sex marriages and a case involving the Defense of Marriage Act are yet to be decided. Joining me in the studio to discuss the implications is Jennifer Olson, a program director for LGBTQ affairs at the University of Arizona. Also with us, Kelly Olson. She and Jennifer have been domestic partners for eight years. Jennifer and Kelly, thanks so much for being here today. For Kelly, us. can you start by just telling us a little bit of the background, summarizing the two cases that are before the Supreme Court right now? Sure. As you mentioned, Maria, we have two cases that are rather different um, because one deals with Proposition 8 in California, which struck down marriage after it had been granted in Cal after people had been getting married in California. Um, and then the other one deals with the Defense of Marriage Act. It deals specifically with part of the Defense of Marriage Act that prevents the federal government from recognizing same-sex marriages, even in states that are recognizing those marriages right now. Right. And what's the, there are some pretty substantial implications, obviously, of both. But um, the DOMA Act has some, some big financial issues attached to it, doesn't it? Right. The current case um, dealt with estate tax and a woman whose partner died um, and normally if if their marriage would have been recognized which New York did recognize for them but the federal government didn't she wouldn't have had to pay estate taxes on the money that was left to her by her wife um, but because the federal government didn't recognize that she was asked to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in estate taxes um, so that's where that came up but there are over a thousand federal benefits that come along with marriage and so really the implications are large and across the board and, and are different for each couple. So let's talk about the state laws regarding gay marriage. And um, can you tell them how all of this involves couples in Arizona like you? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to talk about that, Jim? Yeah, so let some? me tell you a little bit about our story. So we've been together for eight years. We are recognized as domestic partners in the city of Tucson because, because legally that's as much as we can do here at this time. Although I definitely refer to Kelly as my wife and we consider ourselves married, but we're not recognized legally. We also have two young children and so um, it would mean the world to us to be able to to get married and be married and have all of the rights that come along with that, including custody of our own children. Yeah, so anything? marriage has taken on a whole new meaning for us, just wanting to protect our family um, like everyone does. 
And how old are your children? We have one-year-old twins, so we're very busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's rare tired. for us yeah. to be out of the house just together as adults, so <laughs> yeah. this is exciting. <laughs> now, since the justices haven't ruled, let's take the scenarios on each side. Um, what if they uphold both of these cases? Maybe break them down by the state and the federal. Sure. It's, it's difficult to say because so much depends on how they write the decision. Um, it's possible, you know, technically they could decide, especially in the California case, that states, that it's unconstitutional for states to not allow same-sex marriage. I don't think anybody thinks they're going to go that far. Um, I don't, but even if it just means California gets marriage back because they decide that, you know, there wasn't really anybody to challenge it um, because the, you know, the governor and attorney general didn't want to, something like that means California would have marriage back, which would be great for California, and it would still mean that over something like 30% of the population would then live in states that allow marriage right now, which is an inc incredible pace. Um, but it wouldn't mean anything directly for Arizona unless they had a broad sweeping opinion yet. But it would, but it would be a good it's still progress. moral and We celebrate you know, every victory. step in, the, in, the, in progress. Yeah. And you know, same with the federal one, it's difficult to tell if, if the court might say something like, um, the federal government's going to defer to the state you live in to decide whether it recognizes your marriage. And that would be progress in those states that do recognize marriage. Unfortunately, Arizona isn't one of those yet. Right. Um, but it would be a step in the right direction for families to be able to protect each other and their children. So to answer your question in terms of how this impacts us personally, yes. I think any way that it comes down, it's probably not going to impact our relationship right now, but it does impact us in the bigger picture of, of baby steps towards, towards progress. And that matters because it helps normalize, you know, the you know, all of the LGBT couples that have families that live both in states that recognize their relationships and families and in states that don't, that, that we're, we're already here and we love each other and we want to protect our families like everybody else. And so even though we might, we might not be able to, as a result of these rulings, these cases definitely give us hope because it puts it in the national dialogue in a way that, that we need it to be because we aspire to have our family recognized and to be able to protect our children. Now, we have about a minute left. Sure. Jennifer, can you talk about, um, from your role at the University mm -hmm. of Arizona, what this means for institutions like yours and, and what you're trying to do there? Yeah, I mean, again, I think that anything that um, puts this in a national context and, and keeps it as part of the national conversation is, is important for all of us doing this work everywhere and how this impacts the U of A specifically. I mean, the U of A has maintained a commitment to honor you know, domestic partner benefits and recognizes relationships here and will continue to do that. And we're fortunate to, to be in the context of an institution that really values the LGBT members of our community. Good. What's your best hope right now? We have about 10 seconds yeah. left. Tell us what's the best hope for you. We're just happy to see any progress yeah. and anything that can move Arizona along so that people want to stay here mm -hmm. um, is good for the state. And so hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll yeah. keep going in that direction. Yeah, baby steps towards equality. <laughs> yeah. right. Thank you both so much for being here Thank today. You. Thank I you. I really Mary appreciate it. Yes. To comment on any of today's stories or keep up with the latest news, go to our website, azpm.org. I'm Maria Parham. Thanks for watching.